Here in Amy, just seven miles west of Dighton, Dwayne Seifert was working to unclog some grain in one of the bins when the grain came loose all at once, trapping him, even though he was wearing a safety harness. Emergency crews were unable to revive the 59-year-old who had worked at the elevator for more than a decade. His family tells KSN they are grieving, and this loss is hitting the community hard, as Seifert was well known. They say he was a one-of-a-kind family man who loved the outdoors. Seifert is survived by his wife, two sons, and mother. Dwayne was sometimes called H.A. And you, the first word is hard, the second word you can't actually say. <laughs> He's a pusher. And he was a um, compassionate man, a hard-nosed man, um, but one that is at the same time very caring. I knew Dwayne when I was young he was a mentor of mine he i grew up him and my dad were hunting buddies and really good friends he was always involved with uh, family that was his main main concern in life Dwayne was an employee that was completely committed to the mission of serving farmers the people that he was working so hard to try and help were lifetime friends and he knew that their livelihood counted on his ability to perform and get things done at that elevator. I would like to refer to him as a workaholic. He'd work very hard. He'd probably work most people into the ground. Dwayne and I had some clashes along the way. I'm not going to tell you we didn't. We, uh, Dwayne was more of a go-getter. I wanted him to slow down. He was uh, very particular. He liked it his way or that's about, you know, it was his way or the highway with him. You know, I pretty young and I think I can work hard, but I think he could outdo me. Dad relayed a story to me from one of the grain inspectors that came in and says, you could drag a steak from one end of this place to the other on the floor and grill it, not to eat it, because it's that clean. We have lots of employees, and not just in grain, spread out over hundreds of miles, operating by themselves or with other people, and you don't have the benefit then of of having somebody there to cause you to stop and think about what you're about to do next. So I became very concerned about that, and, and I became concerned that we weren't doing all we could to establish this culture of safety. The Garden City Co-op Board decided that uh, we needed to be proactive with safety, and so that's when we established the, the safety committee. They did inspections of elevators. They uh, talked to and put on seminars or um, safety committee meetings that uh, employees attended voluntarily. And so we established them to just go out and look and see and be able to communicate uh, with the employees about what their needs are, what their concerns are, that they may not be willing to communicate to a manager. Wayne was elected as as the chairperson um, with, with the Hill group voting for him. They, um, Dwayne was so particular about his elevator and was such, he was such perfectionist about the way it was kept. It was just kind of what fit. When he was asked to be on this committee, he was a little apprehensive at first, but he thought, well, it might be a good thing. Well, when he comes home from the very first one, he said, they made me chairman. And I said, well, somebody needs to be the hard one. <laughs> There's two different groups of employees that, at least in my experience in dealing with various fatalities and tragedies, that seem to be most vulnerable. The first would be new hires. They don't know as much. A lot of them are young. Uh, they have a tendency to, to take course, uh, shortcuts a little bit more often. Um, in a lot of cases, they need more supervision, and in a lot of cases, we don't have as much supervision for those individuals as we'd like. When we hire new people now, I spend the first day at least that they're, or one of the first days that they're here, uh, going over safety procedures and policies, uh, but that's just classroom training, and then it's up to the location managers to do hands-on training with them and show them what they need to be doing and, and the and not need to be doing. I think with a good safety program, you can adequately address this challenge of, of people not knowing what they're doing and getting themselves in a tough situation. The thing that I worry about 
is the second type of accident that happens. And that is where a person is very familiar with their environment, they're well trained, they're comfortable in that environment. And so they tend to disregard some of the things that, that they know are very important. I think a lot of people disregard the, the safety practices just because they're in a hurry. They're just looking to save a few extra seconds to hurry up and get the job done when those few seconds could cost you literally an arm and a leg or your life. The co-op has a very effective safety program. Um, and, and it's become twofold. Part of it is just the policies and procedures about how we go about our daily task to make sure that safety is always in the forefront and that um, we're having checklists and training and those kind of things that will allow us to recognize that, that uh, there are dangerous parts of our task and to, to do what we can to control and minimize those things. And then the second part of it is, is the, the culture of safety, that we're a group of people that um, we want to return home to our families every night. Um, what we do is important, but nothing's worth risking life or limb for. On that morning of November the 12th, we had hugged that morning, we kissed that morning, told each other we loved each other that morning, and he headed to work. I was about to the main office in Garden when I got a phone call from Jonathan Davis, the second man at at uh, Amy, and he told me that Dwayne was at the, in a bin and was not responding. I got my pickup headed to Amy, called Bence at Dighton, he was the location manager at Dighton, and told him to round up some guys and get out to Amy to help get Dwayne out of the bin because he was in a bin unresponsive. I then got off the phone with Bence, called John Davis at the Amy Elevator, and that's when I found out that John told me that he was in the bin unresponsive in the grain, can't see him. I knew then that, that it wasn't gonna be a good situation because it's, it's a matter of minutes, short minutes, before you can't breathe anymore and, and you suffocate. And once I found out that he had been engulfed, and that's, that's when I made that statement that um, it's, it's not a rescue anymore, it's a retrieval. It's, it's just the nature of, the, of being a, a rescue officer. The day of Dwayne's incident, they had some Milo in a, in a tank that was caked up and wouldn't flow. John Davis had went down into the boot pit to run a rod up into the chute to break break up chunks and to get the grain to flow. Dwayne went in through the manhole cover. He was walking on the grain, had a lifeline and a belt on. But as we all know in the grain industry, if if you're not tied up from above, the the angle when that rope gets tight, you're gonna you're gonna get pulled into the grain. And nobody was an observant of that bin entry. We parked across the road, across the street from the hospital, and I could see that the door was open on the ambulance, and they were working very vigorously on Dwayne. But I grasped my brother's hand, and I told him, I says, Dwayne's gone. I just know he's gone. Once they got him out and we got to the hospital, it was almost instantaneous that he was pronounced. Um, and then that feeling of just that helpless, almost a survivor's guilt kind of feeling set in. You know, why did this happen to him? Of all people, Dwayne, who was so meticulous about everything he did, 
How could this have happened to Dwayne? You can prepare yourself for all kinds of things surrounding an, the death of an employee. You can train and you can do all the things that you supposedly are gonna be prepared for, and you just aren't. You just aren't prepared for the grief. Obviously, getting this bin was number one on Dwayne's list of things that he should do. And when he opened it up, um, the, the right thing for him to think was, this is going to be a bigger job than Jonathan and I are going to get done before noon, and it will probably involve asking for help for others as it becomes available. But that isn't what happened that day. When Jonathan expressed concerns, or, or even without, Dwayne sent the message, this is too dangerous for you. I'll do it. That ought to be the ultimate red flag. It just wasn't, was not expected, not of Dwayne. He's, uh, of course, always safety-minded, you know, and the chairman of the safety committee. And I kept thinking, uh, what would he have been thinking to do something this, like that? That just was out of character. Dwayne's death rocked the community of Dighton, and it, it rocked us here at the Garden City Co-op as well. Through, through Dwayne's leadership and the safety committee, he virtually knew every employee here. Everybody sent, felt a sense of responsibility, um, a sense of disbelief. And, and then I, th I think that there was just a real, almost anger and frustration that somehow all of us, ultimately me, was responsible for what had happened that day. That's a hard thing to deal with. The Garden City Co-op has always had great policies in place, and since the accident, they're just trying to fine tune them, get them even better. Uh, but some of the major ones we have now are our bin entries. Um, now we, uh, a supervisor has to be present for, for each bin entry. We have to have a supervisor sign off. Uh, before any, any employee can enter a bin. Um, and when I'm talking supervisor, it's not the location supervisor. Um, the reason for that is uh, I feel that they want somebody that's off-site, a, a fresh pair of eyes that isn't there day in and day out to take a look at the situation and, and determine whether it's safe or not. Regardless of what they're doing, whether it's lockout, tag out, whether it's bin entry, you know, we have one more person to run it by before they're allowed to do anything. We um, put lots of things in place, but it, probably the most important thing we did was put those men in place because the people are what stops accidents. I believe that all the policies and the procedures and the forms are all a part of it. But that's probably the most important safety thing we did, was put people in place. What we had was not a safety program problem. It was a human being problem. It's important for companies to almost plan for inefficiency that will cause an employee to slow down and not put themselves at risk. So you add enough personnel to make sure that there's checks and double checks. You put enough pieces of paper and reports and clearances and those kind of things in place to make sure that, that people are taking that extra second and thinking about the job that we're about to do. And then you do a good job continually of explaining that this is not a hassle. This is not a bureaucratic nightmare where we're just adding more and more paperwork that detracts from you doing your job, then in fact, that is your job. Your job is not only to get the job done, your job is to get the job done safely. And if you can't do it safely today, then we'll wait till tomorrow. And that is counterintuitive to anything that happens in agriculture. Because in agriculture, we're all about efficiency. We're all about um, testosterone and getting it done. And, and we're the hardest working, most productive. And, and that's the way farmers are. 
That's the way co-ops are. That's the way agribusiness is. That's the culture that, that we've evolved into, and it's hurting and killing people. There's no way for them to 100% guard us because of the fact that it, it's virtually up to the employee. It's up to the employee to take responsibility for their own safety. There's no amount of paperwork that they can throw at us that is gonna physically make an employee do it the safe, safest way possible. If an employee wanted to cut corners, they very well could. I think that the only way to guard against that is to uh, make your employees knowledgeable. Every employee, from the, the highest up to the lowest on the totem pole. Because if you have all these eyes looking at all this stuff, that's your only way that you're gonna, you know, have people picking up on these. Uh, well, he's filling the paperwork out, but he's not actually locking it out. You just have to have faith in your employees that they're gonna do what's best for them. The story that we have of the tragedy here at Garden City Co-op has to do with an incident that happened in a grain elevator by an employee taking a shortcut and getting in a bin that he never should have gotten into. The message, though, is not about a grain elevator versus anything else that we do. The message is that people um, make bad decisions in surroundings that they feel comfortable in when they're under pressure. So, in fact, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but the better you train, the more comfortable your people feel, the more likely there is for them to make a bad decision. And so along with the training and the procedures, you have to make sure that there's this culture and commitment behind the scenes. And that culture and commitment extends not just to what happened to us in a bin entry fatality, but it extends to every part of our operation. So our story isn't a grain elevator story. It isn't a bin entry story. It's about one of the best trained people we had on staff lost himself in the moment and took some shortcuts that ultimately cost him his life. And that can happen whether you're working at a cotton gin in South Texas, or it can happen if you're a potato farmer in North Dakota. Just like I say, there is patience is a virtue. Double check, recheck, um, stop and think before you place your hand, before you put your step, step forward, um, before you enter anything. Um, because the sun's going to rise tomorrow whether we want it to or not. Uh, tomorrow will be a new day. Um, but just take the time and effort to uh, stop and think. When it comes to safety, there is no chain of command. If you see a supervisor doing something wrong, feel free to say something to him. If And sometimes that's hard to do with a supervisor. Um, if that doesn't work or you don't feel comfortable, you can talk to any safety committee member, anybody in upper management, uh, if you see somebody doing something unsafe, and, and we'll address the situation. Everything material in this world can be replaced, but you cannot replace a person. You can't replace the experiences that they've got. You can't train somebody to be like them. You can't fill that gap. But the main goal every day is everybody goes home. But at home, you're somebody's husband, you're somebody's wife, you're somebody's dad, you're somebody's mom, grandma or grandpa. And there's no one else that can replace you in that role. So my advice is, safety rules that you have, they're there for a reason, because everybody wants you to go home. Just because it hasn't happened to us doesn't mean that potential has gone away. It's still there. And sooner or later, it may not be the big thing that gets you, but if you have enough of the little things line up just right, it can still happen. 
So don't take a chance. It's not worth it. And it starts when you leave the door in the morning. If you got to drive, click the seat, seat belt. That's where it starts. And if you start there, you'll work your way into the rest of it. Understanding what exposures, what, what risks there are to your employee group, and then reducing that risk to a point where it's acceptable is really the first step in developing any kind of safety program. And if they can't remove the risk, if they can't, if they can't stop the, the thing that could hurt them, or if they haven't been trained, employees need to feel confident and empowered to back up from the situation and get help. I've been involved in agriculture for a long, long time. And um, I've done and seen people do some really silly things that put themselves and others at risk. And I'm glad that over time we've developed as an industry um, more of a commitment to safety. And so we're doing a better job of, of understanding risk, putting policies in place to address that, to make sure that people don't get hurt. But ultimately, it comes down to the person doing the job. Our employers can train us, provide us the safety equipment, personal protective wear, um, build wonderful machines with all kinds of safety apparatus built in, provide checklists and layers of management and all kinds of things. But ultimately, none of that can save us from ourselves. It's not up to your supervisor or your company or anybody else to make sure that you go home safely tonight to your family and friends and to your life away from work. That's your responsibility. One of the most important assets uh, our businesses need to understand is our, our personnel. You know, you can have a bad thing occur to a facility and insurance can replace that facility, but you cannot replace the individuals. Uh, and it truly is the individuals that make the company valuable. It's their service, their knowledge, their skill set. And it takes a long time for an employee to, to really bring value to an organization. I would certainly encourage boards of directors, general managers, to take a real hard look at how they value the employees. A lot of our facilities are older. They need upgrades. Many of those upgrades don't necessarily make your wheat worth more, your corn worth more. But they do bring value to the employee and the work environment they have to work in and how safe that environment is. As for board of directors and management, my, my most important thing would be to be involved. Don't think it's just automatic. Don't think you don't have a role in it. Everybody has a role. Everybody plays that part. And um, nobody can close their eyes. Nobody gets that luxury. As managers, as directors, as the people that hold the poor purse strings of this company, of your company, you need to make sure that your commitment is in place, that, that you're not just providing training, but that you are addressing the culture of your company, that, that you've provided enough people, enough equipment, you haven't, you haven't had unrealistic expectations about what somebody can get done in a day, that people are not overly tired or frustrated. Um, all those things fall back to us as managers and owners of companies to make sure that, that we haven't taken a shortcut just like one of our employees might. And that's a priority at my business. You must 
tell your spouse or your friend or your mom or your dad, whoever you are with, that you love them every day and hug them. And if you do have an argument or you're angry about a situation that happened that day, talk it out because you never know when it's going to happen. Someone can be taken away from you very, very quickly. And I have learned from one thing for sure that I wanted to pass on to any agriculture-related employee, employer, that I would tell you if you have rules and regulations, those are there for a purpose. Abide by them because they someday could save your life.